Hi there, this is Robin Norgren. I'm your host of Creativity Montessori and the Meaning of Life. And I wanted to start with a lecture that Dr. Maria Montessori um, did in 1946. It's in a series called the 1946 London Lectures, and it talks about um, spontaneous activity. A friend of mine has a little girl and wished to give her freedom. One day, the girl, the child, disappeared from her sight. This worried the mother, who came to me in great distress, asking what she should do. I said, leave the child alone and watch what she does. Do not abandon her, but watch from a distance. You can go to her if she needs help. She told me afterwards that the child took a footstool and carried it around. Although she had many toys, the family was rich. What gave her real happiness was carrying around this footstool. This sort of activity can be seen in all children of this age. This phenomenon has been observed often, everywhere, and has been described as a phase in American books on psychology. Children need to carry heavy things at this age. Um, side note, the age being between the ages of two and a half and, uh, f- and five. It is necessary for their development. They are porters and like it immensely. For one and a half years or more, children carry heavy things. Perhaps the first work man did on this earth was to transport things from one place to another. As soon as the child has acquired this form of independence, he begins to carry heavy things and do difficult things. We call it maximum effort. He climbs on chairs. He goes upstairs. He does all kinds of things which require a great effort. He doesn't just practice a new ability. The new conquest enables him to exert great effort. This is called Hormé. Horme asks the child to exert the maximum effort to go into the world and make these difficult movements. Children ev- evidently have a natural urge, a determined urge, because all children all over the world have the same need to exert a maximum effort at this age. I once knew a lady who had a beautiful boy of one and a half years. She was interested in my ideas, but she gave him far too much freedom. She did not watch him. This lady had an exaggerated idea of freedom. We must watch the child and help him if necessary. We must not just abandon him in the house. One day she heard the child saying groaningly to himself, Be careful, be careful. She went into the drawing room where he was and where there was a beautiful carpet. He was carrying a jug full of water from another room with tremendous effort. The mother said, What an effort for nothing. Let me carry it for you, dear. And she took the jug from him to carry it for him. The child was desperate. Something had been spoiled for him when his effort was interrupted. The greater the effort, the greater is the child's pleasure and the worse, any interruption. We must realize that just toys, especially light toys, do not satisfy children. They can do nothing with them. They must be able to do things which require a great effort. They need big, heavy things. Children love to empty out waste paper baskets, pick up all the bits of paper, and then put them in again. I remember a mother who saw her small child empty a waste paper basket on the floor and begin happily picking up the pieces and putting them back again. The child's nose was not clean, but he was happy. In horror, the mother called her, her, um, they call him a nurse back in those days, to clean the child's nose and take the things away from him. Children make a great effort to conquer the environment. They do as much as they can, as soon as they can. They apply a maximum effort. I have a photograph of a child I once watched. She was a small child of two and had a big tummy. And she was carrying a loaf of bread nearly as large as herself. 
She was balancing it on her tummy and carrying it with great difficulty. The grown-ups around her were anxious to help, but she walked along and put her loaf with a supreme effort on the dinner table. The child does not does work. The child does work which may not be important for the world, but which is important to him. It is not that they wish to be useful, but that they must do these things for their own development. Nature urges them to do exercises through which their development can be accomplished. The exercises that children do help their adaptation to the environment. The first adaptation to the environment is to become conscious of it. And to become conscious of it, they need to acquire knowledge. Children acquire knowledge through experience in the environment. And we must train ourselves to know this and understand it. Today I want to share with you an artist interview uh, with Andrea Gutierrez. The name of her business is Little Big Head. And I interviewed her a few years back about how she came into her creative uh, voice. Her creative influences are childlike imagination, the natural world, storytelling, vintage, and Edward Gorey. And her preferred medium, pen and paper. Andrea says, I love to draw, plain and simple. I'm terribly fond of fauna, flora, constellations, Victorian houses, old books, and tea. I find inspiration from children and their secret stories. I also like children who have bird heads. I have worked in oils, dabbled in acrylics and watercolors, but I love inks best. I also like to challenge myself with needle and thread with occasional dolls, including making a few owls and mandrakes. I have conceptualized and created artwork for a few bands, locally and abroad, for use on album covers and merchandise. I have also done logo designs, spot illustrations, design business cards, t-shirts, and even tattoos for anyone who wants them. I'm proud to have my work find permanent homes in private collections all over the United States, Canada, England, France, Australia, and New Zealand. And you can check out her work at mylittlebighead.com or ciderandfawn.blogspot.com. What is one of your earliest creative memories? I remember my childhood home always either drawing or playing dress up in the backyard. Since I have an older sibling by about nine years, I had had to learn to occupy myself through imagination. Sometimes that imagination led to creating. The very first thing I can remember making is a school bus from a milk carton, which probably led to the realization of using everyday items for things, like my next creations, which were toilet paper roll dolls. How did you find your creative voice? I think it was both years in the making and instant, if that can make any sense. I truly believe this is what is inherent in me, God-given, entwined in my very fibers. It does and can take some years to truly establish yourself, but mostly it is a continual discovery. I am not sure if I can really pinpoint in time when my creative voice came, but I can tell you it had blossomed again about a year ago after my daughter was born. Did your creative habits make a smooth transition into your adult life? And what did the evolution look like? I would say yes. Drawing is something I have always done, even doodling at work. My supervisors knew I was done with my tasks and just waiting for the next assignment. I used to hide who I was, never wanting to share, so it was actually few people who knew that side of me until I was older. My boyfriend, husband now, encouraged me by sketching, gifting me sketchbooks and really helping to, which really helped in bringing about my talent. 
Though it was hidden for some time, it was a major part of who I was, and I wasn't going to lose that about myself. If you had a creative hiatus, what event or circumstance brought you back to your creative lifestyle? I was plateaued for a time when I was working a lot and became pregnant and had my daughter. Shortly after she was born, I realized that I had lost a bit of myself by not expressing that daily creativity. I realized it was necessary to my person, like something I needed to survive. I began exploring the internet and finding places and people whose aesthetics I admired and got right back into doodling again. It took me some time to find who I was again, but I am glad that I did. How has God been a part of your creative process or lifestyle? I cannot deny that this is a gift he has given. The talent I have comes from him alone, and I am so very thankful for it. As I get older, I realize this more and more. I can honestly say that I never truly had a handle on that truth until recently. Now, as I am given more opportunities, I see that I want to glorify him through it. I want to allow the great stories of his truth into my art and eventually story writing. I have been told in various ways how my work is still both childlike sweet and sad at the same time. I know this is a direct result of who I am as a person, how I saw life growing up. I am a realist in my surreal expression, I suppose. Ultimately, all life is in his providence, and I want that to be reflected somehow, whether sub subtly or otherwise. Is there a particular moment where your creativity became infused into a spiritual practice? I've never really separated the two, who I am and what I do. I have always seen it as one, just simply who I am. I believe when I am praying, and in particular, when he is revealing areas in my life I need to give over to him, that permeates in what I do, art included. I do hope to have that mark my work even more now, and especially as I seek more prayer in my life. Is there one particular thing that you do that ushers you into a place of worship? Weekday mornings, I am usually alone once I have taken my daughter to school. And it allows me to have my tea and breakfast while I read the word and devotions. Usually after the last bite I have taken, I spend a few moments in prayer with my prayer list that I've begun to compile. This brings me to such a sweet place in him, regardless of how life is going at the moment. All life is worship, and I hope he will always remind me when my worship is straying from him to something else. My favorite quote is, God writes the gospel, not in the Bible alone, but on trees and flowers and clouds and stars. That quote is by Martin Luther. The selected passage for our Lecta Divina today is 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. And this is from the New Living Translation. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God and he is most careful with you. Let's hear that passage again. So be content with who you are and don't put on airs. God's strong hand is on you. He'll promote you at the right time. Live carefree before God. He is most careful for, with you. Do you remember the last time you felt content with who you are? With the wonderful responsibilities and changes of adulthood come a certain loss of innocence. You might have started to see your body, your family situation, your social skills and your talents only in comparison with others. Others who had less, more, or something you did not have at all. 
How much of your time and energy goes into trying to change who you are, especially as a woman? Compensating for your weaknesses, trying extra hard to play up your strengths. If God has shaped your life, knowing you before time began, maybe you can really trust him with who you are. After all, he is the most careful with you. What do you think that word careful might mean based on the character of God? Will you pray today and ask God to reveal who you truly are, who he has made you to be? Confess your insecurities, the places where it seems his hand isn't strong enough to overcome your flaws. Implore the Lord for strength to live carefree in the knowledge of his power. In whose company are you most tempted to put on airs? Remind yourself of God's strong hand on you today when you encounter them. Be yourself. Be carefree. Thanks so much for stopping by today. You can find me all over the internet, but you can find all of my links over on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren, N-O-R-G-R-E-N, or you can look under at U-B-U for life all words spelled out.